And so we watched the video for the A not B error. And so what was Pierce's explanation for why children failed? He thought that children still identified action uh, objects with the actions that were attached to them. So remember, say, it's this eraser, all right? And it was always hidden here. So the child has, child's representation of this object includes this action, OK? Because it keeps doing it, according to Piaget. So the object is not separate from this action. It's almost an extension of the action. It doesn't stand on its own. Hence, when the object is moved, in order to retrieve the object, the infant is still doing the same thing. But this is not the only explanation in town. Adele Diamond has argued, and very convincingly so, that infant's memory, so how long does the infant wait, for example, before being allowed to search? And executive function abilities, executive function, we will see it later, is your ability to control your attention, to monitor your attention, and also to inhibit, to stop yourself from doing from saying things that you don't want to say but are automatic, right? So the Stroop task, for example, you, you guys all know the Stroop task, relies on inhibition, good inhibition, right? Because, for example, you see a color but have to read it. Or you automatically read it but have to say the color. So you stop yourself from giving a response that is automatic and focus on something else. So in this case, the argument then becomes that it is so automatic now for the child to reach this way that the child cannot totally stop themselves. Very similarly, uh, motor perseveration uh, argument by René Bayer-Jean says that children kind of get in this loop of reaching for the same place. You think what? Efendim? You think what? Şey, um, I don't know what I said. I'll just say the meaning once more. Uh, I'm just trying to say, so the idea is that uh, the, ch the child keeps doing the same action such that stopping that action becomes difficult for the child. Okay? These, these are related. And Yaren, Yaren right, mm -hmm. has a question. The child, classical conditioning, there is no reflexive reward here, right? No, no, it's you mean operant conditioning then? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, well, the, the, it, it is not repeated long enough such that the child would have been operantly conditioned to reach for this place. As you can see, the child only reached for the place four times in the video before the place changed. It is not really enough of a encoding there for it to have been operantly conditioned, or at least for the explanation to be that. But it's a very good way of thinking. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, in the video, the other blanket was uh, really smooth the yes. first time, and the second time, it was really covered. Mm -hmm. So child maybe get confused uh, and think about Why would they get confused? Because they have always been choosing the one that had something under the blanket. Yeah. So the one that was attractive, was the kabodic blanket. So if now the other blanket is in the same way, it should at, at least give a cheat to the child, a cue. But regardless of that, it wouldn't deter the child from reaching for it, if you think about it. Because that blanket, the way it is, bumpy, has been providing the novel stimulus. So if the child saw that the bumpy blanket is in the second place, there is no reason why they should avoid it. So it can't be an explanation for why the child is still reaching for the other one. OK? In other words, this is a competence versus performance problem. We have, have we talked about competence performance? A little bit in chapter one, I think, right? So this is basically the argument that the child has the competence to carry out the task. They could succeed. They know enough. They're able enough. But performance factors, meaning the de details of this testing situation, are complex such that the child is not able to show what they know. 
competence versus performance is, I think, the universal argument of all undergraduate students whenever they get a bad grade on the exam. So you should actually know this, kulak dolgunuz olmalı at least, uh, very well. It is not that I didn't know or I didn't study. The, the test was too long. The test was too hard, you know? But I knew. That's a competence argument you're making. But I failed because of performance factors. There wasn't enough time. This is the same argument. The child knows object permanence, but fails because the task is asking for memory demands that are above the child's age. The <coughs> task is, is asking for executive function abilities that are beyond the child's reach. Uh, <coughs> yes, these two. And so then it becomes a, the, the child's performance, the fact that they fail, becomes an issue of these performance details. That is the competence versus performance argument. OK. For the memory, evidence seems to show that seven and a half month olds succeed if they're allowed to search immediately after the display. Immediately meaning, I mean, you saw in the video, my friend did not spend 10 <coughs> minutes before she allowed the child to search. But what did she do? Why was she um, uh, making sound with the vitamin bottle before she shook it? She wanted to make sure the child looked at the bottle as it was being hidden, so that we can't argue that the child didn't see where it was, right? That's why it was shaking. But she hid it under the blanket, waited a moment, and then put it. What if you know, she had a tray? and she pushed it towards the child. What if there wasn't a tray? It was always in front of the child. What if the child could search as it was being hidden? It seems like then seven and a month, seven and a half month olds are more successful. Wait. But also, if you hold the arms and force the child to wait for two seconds, A not B mistake happens. Success at nine months after five seconds, at 12 months after 10 seconds. So you see, the amount of time the infant can keep representing the object in this new spot increases with age. Let me finish the slide, I'll take the questions. And there is success when infants are allowed to search right away or if they keep uh, sta straining toward object until her hands are released. So if the infant is going like this, if you keep, if you let the infant do that, the infant marks the location by uh, where their body is pointing at, and so they are more successful. A not B happens even with transparent covers. So even when it's not a blanket that is hiding it, but imagine a transparent cover. So the child can see inside it. Oh, and here there is no memory uh, load, uh, or there isn't as much as the one previously. This is interesting. So in order to overcome this, Memory, is it only a matter of memory? Some researchers have used transparent covers. Imagine the blanket is a tool, for example. The child seems to, at up to a certain age, the children still seem to go to the wrong spot first. Yes, that's the whole point. So is it about hmm? is it inhibition? Inhibition. Yeah, it could be inhibition. That would be a very good response to this. OK. And that is, inhibition is actually the second bullet. Maybe the baby just can't stop herself from reaching toward the old spot. It was also Bayerjan's argument, the motor perseveration. Keeps doing the same thing. So it's not about representing the object. It's about the action. Could be. OK. Now, at substage five, infants can find the object when they see it go under the second cloth. OK. but. OK, this is called the invisible displacement task. Ladies and gentlemen, if I do, for example, you know how I said if there are like four elements of a question, I want all four. If I ask you to describe the developmental trajectory of object permanence, nasıl geliştiğini anlatın demek istiyorum. Every time I use the word developmental trajectory, uh, everybody asks, what is it? I'm I'm asking for you to describe how the development unfolds through time. 
Okay? And here, you then need to talk about when children fail, when children pass the standard task but fail the A not B, and what they are. You need to tell me then also the invisible displacement task, which is, so when do they fail here? If the object, remember, in the video we watched, the object was clearly visible for the child, right? It was shaken, made sound. What if you hid it subtly, you know, hidden in your hand? It seems then that the 12 to 18 month olds who had already passed A not B even are failing. Okay? So it seems it's a very fragile. So for Piaget, so you know how like there are some hojas who give partial credit when you answer a question. I do give partial credit. And there are some who say right or wrong. Piaget was the second kind of uh, theorist. For, because he's looking to see when an ability is fully developed. For him to say children have object permanence, he wants to see object permanence no matter what the modification of the task is. <coughs> okay? So the child should be able to, to pass the standard, the A not B, the invisible displacement. Okay? That's when. And we're going to see he's later criticized, for example, for other abilities too. He wants the children to be able to verbally explain and explain well when they have a certain level of reasoning. Okay. Stage six, finally, yes. Uh, how does this uh, invisible <coughs> displacement? Yeah. Not related with memory, or not just related with memory, because you know, uh, the baby is attending to the object. If object permanence is not just related with memory, but also object permanence, so is invisible displacement. In invisible displacement, you basically hide the object twice. Once in your hand, then under yeah. a cloth. And then when you hide it for the first time, it doesn't you know, process in the working memory? Uh, as I said before, nobody's against the idea that memory factors into this. But there's also a conceptual shift, he argues, about the properties of objects, okay? So especially people who later followed Piaget, some of them are called Neo-Piagetians. They revised parts of Piaget's theory. There have been several, uh, Robbie Case, for example, is one of them, who worked exclusively, not exclusively, but who gave a lot of emphasis to memory. He actually built equations that showed how the working memory developed uh, in relation to these tasks. And so, yes, it possibly plays a po part, but for Piaget, it is more than memory. It is your understanding, your <coughs> expectations about what happens to the object. Can it disappear? You know, if you know it can't disappear, you will keep searching. You will have the impetus to keep it in your mind to start with. Okay. So at substage six, finally, infants have mental representation. They get it. They continue to search, even if the object is inside the container while it's being hidden. So the child is thinking, it must be somewhere. An object can't disappear, right? Uh, and so that is the concept, the, the uh, understanding that is developing for him. And so maybe Piaget had a point. Even today, you do the same things the same way with Toprak, you are going to get the same results. So it hasn't really changed. He was on point. And also I want to highlight the fact that he might have, Piaget might have started with the observations of his three children, but he actually founded his own institute at the University of Geneva, and he had, has a lot of empirical work on this. So don't think he just worked on his three children. That's where he got his inspiration and detailed observations from. Then he has books and books of empirical work that still would hold, if done the same way, it still holds today. Okay. All right. This is about inhibition. I'll pass. Uh, not very important for now. Uh, and also, I'm in a time crunch. Here, um, there are other ways of looking at what infants understand of object uh, representation. This one is... Uh, a violation of expectancy paradigm, meaning, now, you know how like uh, both 
adults, and children, and even babies have anticipations, meaning they expect something to happen. They have expectations. If you present them something that goes against their expectations, we expect that the infant will be surprised, right? If you show them something. For example, if infants know that every time you drop something, it drops down. Every time you let something go from a height, it goes down. What if we show infant something where I drop something and it just hovers? They look more, which tells us that they expect it to drop, right? So in this violation of expectancy paradigm, and you will not forget this from my previous experience, I will show you this next year and you will still remember it because of the way I described this experiment. So here's a short carrot. And here is a um, uh, uh, block. And so what is happening here is that the short carrot, imagine me, is walking behind the block. As the short carrot is walking, it becomes invisible because the block is big. The same thing happens with the tall carrot. Tall carrot moves. The block is big enough that the children don't expect to see the carrot, but they expect to see it from the other side. What if there was an opening? Somebody cut out a window in this block. Again, short carrot walks. Because the short carrot is short and the window is here, we don't expect to see the carrot, right? in the window, but we expect to see the carrot when it comes out. What happens with the tall carrot, though? Tall carrot being your jedoja. <laughs> and so, uh, I'm telling you, you will not forget this next year. Tall carrot moves. <laughs> tall carrot is not visible in this display, but comes out of the other side. Now, OK, so we're showing an impossible event, OK? So because the expectation is that because the tall carrot is tall, as it passes this opening, it should be visible, right? We all expect it. Do infants expect it? If we don't see it here, we would assume that the carrot got stuck, right? Right over here. It's not moving. But what if it goes out of the other side without ever being visible here, the impossible event? Two, huh? Maybe there's a staircase. Good thinking, but probably the infants aren't real. Or maybe, I mean, the carrot could have crawled. Now, I mean, as we get older, of course, right, our expectations of what this carrot is going to do, maybe, I don't know what it did, maybe it like lay down SWAT style. But here what it is is two and a half month olds look longer at the impossible event, meaning what? They have some rudimentary understanding of object permanence because they expect to see the tall carrot in the window. Very clever experiment, right? I'm not going to go over this one. Can you repeat what happens? Can I repeat what happens? The result of it? Yeah. Okay. So if the infants see the impossible event, do you remember what the impossible event is? When the tall carrot isn't seen in the window but take, gets out from the other side. Two and a half month olds look longer, which means they're surprised which means long before they will pass object permanence, they actually have some very basic understanding, some expectation of an object's permanence. OK? So that's what this task is showing. Criticisms against these violation of expectancy paradigms or the um, evidence that is uh, attained from them it's the question, what does it measure? What do they measure? So we are seeing infants looking longer at things, right? Uh, we, it is telling us infants are surprised. We infer that surprise means they had a prior expe expectation that wasn't fulfilled. But can we claim that that is knowledge? What? Can we claim that is knowledge? Just because someone is surprised, because they have an expectation, can we say that that person has an in-depth understanding of a concept? Right? 
For example, you have an expectation <coughs> that every day that, you know, sun will rise from the east. Olur mu? Evet, olur. From the east. And so your house, and every day, the sun rises, correct? And probably, let's say you lived in that same house for your entire life. So you remember yourself when you were six years old, and you were seeing the sun rise, for example, and not being surprised. If one day you're up in the same hour, okay, it's still six o'clock, it's not um, light, uh, it's, par pardon me, the sun is already up, for example, you might wonder how did this happen, correct? Because you have an expectation that it will be that way all the time. Do you have, at that point in time, as a six-year-old, an understanding of how, why we think that the sun rises, the rotation of the earth? We know none of this, right? We just have a very basic expectation about where the sun rises, for example. Hmm. Actually, a knowledge and understanding of the object is still present, even if it's not seen. But it's an under so some argue that it is going to be an understanding of the properties of objects. An object cannot vanish if it's just out of sight, right? The objects will move in predict predictable ways. If something moves together, probably they're attached together, for example. These kinds of expectations all go into the concept, kavram olarak düşün, the concept of an object. So we may have expectations before we fully appreciate the concept. That's, that's the argument that some are ma making. Some others might claim that just because the infants are surprised at such young ages, they also have an understanding. Uh, there's a lot of debate and there's also a lot of shady areas. Next year, if you take 350, we will go over these a little bit more and it's going to be more evidence-based, so we're going to talk <coughs> more research and less general knowledge, okay? All right, let me move forward. Other ways of studying object representation, uh, dynamical systems approaches, one. Uh, so this approach claims that cognitive development in infancy involves not a shift from sensory motor to conceptual intelligence, but growing abilities to coordinate. Remember all of those actions were actually interdependent on one another in dynamical systems theory. The systems were integrated. So these various systems are better coordinated in this view. So, for example, if the infant's posture is changed at the B part of the task, infants are more likely to succeed. So instead of like sitting, for example, and having to coordinate, if they could move themselves more easily, if their posture is changed, their success rates also go up. So what is it telling us? You guys have been highlighting memory is a part of this. I agree, memory is a part of this. They will tell you that not only memory, but infant's own body its own affordances at that point in time is also important. A simple thing we're looking at, whether some infant, say Toprak, can actually have ideas about objects, has got generated so much research, and we can still debate. And that's the beauty of research, right? And so, it's not because we're unable to find answers, it is because we are searching for evidence in theory-guided ways, right? Uh, and carrying out these expectations. Uh, dearest friends, if you're going to be uh, engaged in your cell phones, please at least do it under the table. Psst. Okay, criticisms of the alternative methods. I see a deep red. It's okay, so here, um, Yes, results are highly dependent on experimental conditions. Uh, slight variations in procedure leads to huge differences. How many times you hide the toy is important. How many seconds the infant wait is important. I mean, it changes the results, whether they succeed or fail. <clears throat> Which brings to mind ecological validity. One thing is for sure, though. 
By the end of sensory motor stage, just as Piaget thought about it, infants do pass object permanence task and are less affected by these little variations. Okay. Other criticisms. Is the infant more able than Piaget envisioned? Most likely. All right. Huh? So many criticisms. Mental representations, for example. So according to, to uh, Piaget, we know mental representations will happen towards the end of sensory motor period. That's going to mark the shift from sensory motor period to pre-operational period. Uh, and we're going to see uh, both deferred imitation and also uh, symbolic play, beginnings of language uh, for mental representation. Now, um, is that so? Other research which looks at, for example, the timing of deferred imitation, remember deferred imitation, right? The delayed imitation, right? Uh, also using of operant conditioning uh, tells us that infants are able to do this much earlier than they're one and a half years of age. So for example, this is from your book, figure 6-3. Uh, what they did here, at, I mean, this is extremely cute. So by the way, let me tell you, uh, next week, Tuesday, Gaia Soleil from uh, Boazic University is coming to give a talk. If anybody is interested, uh, we asked her to give us some sample readings. Uh, I can post them on Moodle if you wanted to look over them uh, before you go to her talk. Um, I'll post them on Moodle. You don't have to read them. It has nothing to do with class. It's an easy way for me to reach you, basically. I'm just going to post them for those who are interested. Also, Gaia Hoca has published in issues of sound perception, preferences for different rhythms, both across cultures and different ages. So we just did the infant perception stuff you know, last week. Uh, so some of her studies, uh, that's not what she's going to talk about uh, when she comes next week. Uh, but some of her studies actually speak to that too. Reklamlar. Okay. All right. So here, this is a very cute uh, study where what they do is they uh, introduce a novel toy that the infant hasn't seen before. This is new for the infant. The infant doesn't have this toy at home. And they also do something that is novel. They do an action sequence that is new. Novel means new, right? And so, for example, with this puppet, uh, there is a glove that the puppet is wearing. And you can take the glove, shake it, and it makes a sound, and then put it back on the uh, puppet. So this is not something the baby regularly does, for example, putting on a glove, taking off the glove, and the glove making a sound when shaken. And so what do we see here? Uh, we see that uh, even six-month-olds imitated these actions a day later. So they see, they observe the adult do this, and then a day later they are shown the same puppet, and they perform the action, which means they were able to hold it in mind. So this is one strong objection. Another one comes from operant conditioning. We said that infants' learning, early learning, is very context de dependent. It depends on the situation, right? And here, what we have is that this infant, see there's, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a ribbon that is tied to the infant's foot. And we know that these infants get operantly conditioned every time they kick the mobile moves. Nice. We should have adult versions of this, right? Uh, by the way, I saw a great gadget. You know how we're going to open a Moodle for Paratuza toys? This was awesome because what it does is it takes storybooks and you can, through your phone, project it to the ceiling. So like mother and child could be in bed and mother could be reading a book, but the book is projected to the ceiling. So they're both laying down. And so the mother goes through the picture. Isn't that cute? That's cute. Anyways, uh, and so here the infant is conditioned to kick with this mobile that has the letter A's on it. When you change the letters into something perceptually dissimilar, make them X's, make them O's, 
The infant, for example, ceases to kick. It doesn't generalize at first. Again, does, th does it mean the infant knows A? It's the same argument with the carrot experiment. No, the infant has no understanding of what A is, but recognizes that A is different than O. But this shows also uh, that um, they are learning something, the relationship between kicking and this particular, even when they are three months of age. OK. All right. Newer research also indicates with deferred imitation that there is facial imitation as early as newborns, but also up till six weeks. Six to nine months, they copy actions with objects. 12 to 18 months, they imitate skillfully. So there seems to be some preliminary evidence for mental representations before Piaget claimed they were possible. All right. Another evidence, again, that is used to criticize <coughs> Piaget's substages of infancy is about categorizations. Infants seem to categorize. So for example, this is a habituation study, um, again, from your book here, uh, where how do they know? You can't ask an infant to say, put all of the animals here, put all of the planes there. Interestingly enough, studies that are done with infants, when you put, for example, a bucket of toys, and they're one of two types, you could easily separate them into two categories. Say one of them are soft balls, the others are hard balls. The way infants touch, they have looked at the sequence with which they touch these objects seem to indicate that they are grouping the objects in one way or another. Interesting, right? There's, there are very cool studies that look at infants' grouping of objects through this touching or sometimes through uh, putting them in a bucket that shows that infants aren't even fooled when you try to trick them. So they did animals versus vehicles in one study. So these were vehicles meaning like cars, planes. And to trick the infants, they put uh, eyes and the mouth on the plane, airplane, for example. And there's an eagle. They go to separate groups. And these are very, we will talk about this next year at 3.50 when we talk about the animate, inanimate distinction. There's a lot, of, a lot of research done on these things. What are the perceptual features that give us cues about the animacy of objects? Hold your questions for September. Yes? They start doing it around 18 months of age. So it's still uh, before 24 months, we see an inclination. But this isn't really categorizing. This is like they are grouping, and we understand they are grouping in their mind by touching. But see, there are two types of grouping. We will see in pre -oper operational period that they're actually very bad with categorization, even four-year-olds. What might be happening is that they touch something and find something that is similar, find something that is similar. But in categorization, you come up with a rule, right? All of the soft balls here, all of the hard balls there. They may not start with that. Theirs might be more perceptually grounded. And it could be that they are just moving from one object to the next, one object to the next, rather than having an external rule that is superimposed on all of the objects. Okay. And these are the different views on categorization, which I just talked about when an answering your friend's question. What is your name? Tuche. Tuche. I've asked it before, didn't I? Did you ask it Of course. Uh, be prepared. I ask again and again. That, that's my one stupid stop uh, spot. And I don't want to uh, exaggerate. I have many stupid spots. This is one of them. Yes? Uh, which particular idea of Piaget that this uh, society? So the idea is if infants can categorize, then they probably can mentally represent a class, soft balls. Mm -hmm. If that were the case, then it would be a criticism against them. But I don't know if there are very strong arguments that infants can categorize arbitrary objects. But there's a lot of research done with, for example, animate versus inanimate objects. <laughs> animate things being the things that are alive and move on their own versus 
objects like cars that move but not on their own and they're not alive. It seems like in inf even in infancy, infants seem to be sensitive to these kinds of things. Just a teaser, reklamlar, for next year again, where we will look at studies where if an object that the infant thinks is inanimate starts moving on its own, it becomes scary, right? It's for you too. Most horror movies are based on this premise. Inanimate things start talking and moving. The house comes alive, değil mi? The doll starts talking. There is a reason, it's an innate fear of ours. Think evolutionary psychology now. And so, that's that. A problem solving. At seven to eight months, infants develop intentional means and action sequences. At 10 to 12 months, they uh, engage in an analogical problem. Analogical being trial and error method. They solve problems by doing. Uh, by one year of age, they form flexible mental representations of using tools to get objects. Uh, and they actually can make references about displaced objects, meaning objects that are no longer here. Uh, and so here, this is thought to be a little bit earlier than when T Piaget thought infants get rid of trial and error. For him, trial and error still exists in the substage 5, which is substage 5 is 12 months to 18 months. Uh, and so at this point, it's saying that it happens a little bit earlier. <clears throat> How about the symbolic function of pictures? Does that tell us something about infants' mental representations? Probably so. Just like words represent objects that they have no relation to, objectively. I mean, I use shishe to describe this, but there is nothing shishe about it. It's just an arbitrary word that we use to label this. Uh, a similar relationship, though not identical, identical, exists between pictures and real stuff. So the infant needs to understand the picture of dad is not dad. The picture of mom is not mom. It's a representation of mom. And we see that they don't totally understand this uh, early because before first year of age, before 10 months of age, infants may still try to pet the pictures. They may try to coo to the pictures, right? But slowly, and also with practice, if there's a lot of books at home, if the parents are looking at photographs all the time, labeling, it can happen a little bit earlier too. Like look at grandma, look at grandfather, whatever. And so they start to understand the picture is a representation of the person who's not here. And it's the same thing with objects. It's the same thing with the picture of a dog, for example. Right? Uh, yes. Uh, most 50 to 24 month olds can distinguish between real objects and pictures. They begin using pictures to communicate, to say, look, this is something interesting. And they mostly understand the symbolic nature. Ah, but this is not it. Again, in Psych 350, you're going to see we're going to spend one week on children's understanding of symbolic artifacts. When do children start acquiring information from symbolic tools? Mesela, maps. <coughs> I am not sure I still read maps, by the way. <laughs> but we will see, because understanding a picture is one thing, like looking at the picture and appreciating is one thing. What about if there's a specific kind of information you need and it's hidden in the picture? Maps are exactly that. And we're going to see that that extends to three and a half years of age, and if the task is difficult enough, even later. Okay. Video deficit effect. Now, because infants, and this is relevant, <coughs> this is relevant for us, this is relevant for Emre Bey, uh, this is relevant for anyone and everyone who has a baby around. There is now documented a lot of evidence that infants do not learn from TV. I, I can't say it loud enough. It doesn't matter what the TV is labeled. 
It doesn't matter if it is Galileo TV. It doesn't matter if it is a toddler TV, işte minik TV, whatever it is called. Infants do not learn from TV like they learn from human beings. Who and with children who have been left in front of the TV for long periods of time, we see vocabulary deficits. They have fewer words. They know fewer words than children who do not watch TV. And this was at first confusing because the TV talks too. If all we need is to hear words, if all the infant needed was to hear words, then so imagine yourselves too. You're in this class. Emre Bey is studiously taping us. One day, we will all be on the internet. Next year, a student might actually click and watch it on the internet. Then, um, bizim suçumuz neydi diyorsun, değil mi? And so, but will it afford the same learning experience to that student who's watching in bed? Probably not. Because it is more than what I say. It is your questions. It is the discussions we have, right? It is also the fact that no matter how limited, I try to make eye contact. Most of the time, I'm successful unless you are on your phone. <laughs> Arda. <laughs> huh? Yes. I was talking about you. Senden bahsediyorduk diyorum. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> yes, I know this has been a long class. You have to just bear with me eight more minutes and then we'll be done. You will eat, I will eat, everyone will eat. <gülüyor> okay. Infants can confuse video images with reality. And this, their inability to learn from video information, from digital information, is called the video deficit effect. <laughs> and experts recommend uh, geliyorum, uh, against mass media exposure before two and a half months. This is not only TV. This is your iPad. This is your iPhone. This is your Android phone and Android tablet. It doesn't matter what the brand is. If it's digital, we say, you don't need to show it to your kid before two and a half years of age, but there's a caveat. Recently, in the last six months, uh, American Pediatric Association issued a statement that said, it is okay to interact with tablets when children are below two years of age, between one and two, if the child is interacting with the digital media with their parent. Some parents misunderstand this. Being in the same room with your child does not, is not what is implied. It means, you know how when a child and a parent plays with a ball, they share attention? It's called triadic attention. The child attends to the parent. The child attends to the ball. Parents attend to the child and to the ball. That, that kind of triadic attention needs to be. And they said, I mean, keep it to a minimum and use it mostly for Skyping relatives that are far away. So Skyping with grandfather. Not everybody's living in the same city or the country anymore. Skyping with, uh, or FaceTiming or using whatever device to talk to loved ones isn't as harmful as watching endless cartoons, having the infant play with the tablet. I will talk about it more. But you can Google and find on YouTube videos of cats playing with tablets. <laughs> my cat, and I have a cat, his name is Toby, has a tablet game on my iPad. Really? Yes, there is a mouse. It keeps going around. And if my very clever cat uh, pause it, uh, like it manages to hit it, it goes quick. <laughs> yes. Does he understand that it is a mouse or? See, that's a very good question. <laughs> and we might wonder whether the infant understands what they are doing. But the cat 
follows the mouse and hits it and engages with the, I, I've tried it, I have taken a video of it too. And so, yes, so, so uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> and so what it is, is like sometimes parents think that just because their little baby or their little toddler or their little son or daughter is interacting with media that took a lot of cognitive power for those people to produce the material, interact with, that their kid is very smart. Bak bizim oğlan ne yapıyor? Right? But it isn't that difficult. Think about it. Those gadgets are produced for all of us to use. It doesn't matter whether your IQ is 60 or 140. You should be able to operate a tablet. It's very simple. You put your finger on it, it opens. Right? So the fact that a 14-month-old can point to things on a tablet doesn't tell us that kid is Einstein. Yes. So that was, I felt like I was giving a political speech there, but I was. <laughs> I was. Let me see. Bear with me, I will be fast. Four more slides, then I'm done. And I still have three minutes. Reasoning counting. Wynn has many experiments that look at children's early number sense. At four months, four months, her studies show that if one, mo mo uh, one mouse goes behind the screen and then a hand puts a different ma uh, mouse, then there should be two mice when you lower the screen. The impossible event would be that you put one mouse, add another one, you drop the screen, but you still have one mouse. The impossible event. And she's found that four months, children are actually startled by this. Ha! Huh, where did the other mouse go? And so there's, though, a lot of debate with this. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more when we get to core knowledge on Monday. But uh, as a primer, I need to say that up to three, we seem to be sensitive. But so are intelligent apes. So we need to take that with a grain of salt, too. <coughs> so reasoning, cause, and effect. Um, here, basically, for example, six-month-olds look longer at a causally impossible event. Uh, yes. So if, for example, there are two geometric shapes, a circle and a square. And in the screen, they're moving. You expect that if one, say the circle, hits the other, the other will start moving too, like billiard balls. Right? Who plays billiards here? Billard oynaya. Yes. Bir gün bana da öğret. And so, yes. But what is interesting is that they found that six-month-olds looked longer at an impossible event when the object came close to the other but didn't touch but the other started moving. So they couldn't totally make sense of it, which means that they have some rudimentary cause and effect understanding. OK. This is not important. So we talked about sensory motor uh, stage and finished it. Uh, <coughs> how? So we said what he was right about or what was important. How might have he been wrong? Timing of object permanence, timing of deferred imitation, timing of categorization, timing by trial and error, all seem to occur a little bit sooner than Piaget thought. And this is going to tie in very nicely with the core knowledge theory. Thank you very much. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>